dropping in on you uh, Saturday. I'm just taking a break from what I'm doing work today. I'm about to go chill and relax with the fellas for a minute. Uh, and I decided to talk to you about something that <clears throat> is weighing heavy on my heart. So uh, it won't take long. Uh, this is a short trip. Uh, so I'm going to get right to the point. And this is probably going to twist some people's uh, attitudes and mindsets in a direction that is probably somewhat uncomfortable, uh, inconvenient, and disturbing. And those of you who have followed me for uh, any stretch of time understand what I have declared from the day I stepped out and started speaking publicly on black issues long before the internet and definitely since I've been on this this internet, this social media journey for what, 13, 14 years. I've always said I'm not here for the likes. I'm not here to be liked. I'm not here for the pats on the back, the accolades, the praise. I'm not trying to prove I'm better than the next guy. I'm not out here to compete with no other black people who are putting in work. I'm about brotherhood, but what I will tell you is you're gonna get the truth. You're gonna get what I believe to be the truth. If you can come back with facts to prove to me I'm wrong, I've proven over time that I have no problem coming back and making an apology and offering a retraction to the statement I've made. Now, the one thing you'll find is those times are far, few and far in between because I speak on what I have invested my entire life into understanding. And when I speak it, I speak it from a place of love. I'm not here to destroy or attack, but I am here to hold people accountable and to challenge people. And so I'm going to tell you this. Black ignorance is the blindness which leads the collective to fall into the ditch of racism and oppression. Uh, you've heard me say this many times before that if there's no enemy on the inside, the enemy on the outside can do us no harm. And uh, Neely Fuller Jr. said this about racism. He said, racism, white supremacy, if you, if you don't understand it, if you don't understand how it works, if you don't understand how it impacts you, if you don't understand the mechanism and everything you think you know will only confuse you. Uh, and so what I see is a lot of people walking in ignorance, refusing to seek knowledge, receive knowledge, accept knowledge, but constantly pushing and you wonder why you fall by the wayside because you don't understand how things work. That has been a constant theme that I have talked about. Uh, the media propaganda that constantly spews out negative stereotypes about blacks across the board, whether it be black men, black women, whether it be blacks in general, whether it be the lack of black uh, blacks in the area of academia, uh, all of these different tropes that are pushed out and presented to us, we tend to accept. We tend to ignore the actual true facts. So they line up and they tell us things and then the thing is, everybody's getting all upset about Don Lemon being uh, fired from CNN. Uh, and my thing is, I, I, I'm not a fan of anybody who pushes racial, st racial stereotypes as an exclusive phenomenon. I have talked about black on black crime. Absolutely. Black on black crime exists, but uh, any race you find, you're going to find white on crime, white on white crime, Asian on Asian crime, because most violent crime is what proximal. What does that mean? We tend to get into emotional disagreements with people we know. So then that means that we have to, if we're going to talk about black on black crime, then we must also talk about the fact that 84% to 85% of white people who are murdered are murdered by other white people, but you never hear the term white on white crime. Why? Because it doesn't fit the narrative. It, that particular term was not created as a true representation of a social reality or a social dynamic. It was meant to create a narrative and a stereotype and a presentation and idea that black people are in inherently violent. Now, what it does not acknowledge, 
is the fact that if you take any group of people and you put them in highly impoverished environments, crime rate will go up. The crime rate goes up. People are literally fighting to survive. People who are fighting to survive are going to automatically be more territorial and more violent. And the crime itself is going to automatically produce a high level of violence. So if you're talking about the elevated levels of violence, you can do that and see that across any spectrum where there is a high level of poverty. It's in white impoverished areas the same way it is in black impoverished areas but it's only highlighted and presented in media so when i see don lemon uh and this is a video i've watched with my own eyes talking about the if blacks want to do better they need to pull up their pants well that gives the impression by the statement being made that blacks are the only ones sagging i know for a fact that's not true i'm literally just past a white a white guy sagging literally so that's not true. That's a that's a generational thing. And I you know, yeah, we, we, we got an issue with that. But it's a generational thing. But when you say it like that, you make it seem it's just that. Then blacks need to stop dropping out of school as if whites don't drop out of school. But here's another thing that has to be viewed within the uh, context of this uh, assumptive or uh, presumptuous idea that you know by not dropping out of a school all of a sudden blacks are going to be in a competitive environment first of all i agree 100 percent that blacks don't need to drop out of school but then we must talk about why blacks drop out of school i wrote numerous papers i wrote a position paper on the disproportionality of special education referrals for young black men young black males are referred for special education at a very disproportionate rate despite there not being a necessary uh or a need for as many referrals there's a reason for that when you start alienating young black males in the school system as early as five years old, when you start giving them designations and, and assessments like oppositional defiant disorder and ADHD, things that they can be given psychotropic drugs for. These are schedule two drugs that are highly addictive, have very little medicinal person purposes, but they tend to make black males more docile and make them sit still. All while all of the scientific evidence says that young black, well, young children, period, do not learn best in an environment where they are forced to sit still. They learn better in environments where they move. They learn better, better in environments where there is activity going on. Black children learn better in an environment where they are literally engaged musically. That's why Ryan Clark Incidentally, a white male has one of the most successful schools in the inner city across this country because he understood that and he literally promotes that type of behavior, not just from his students, but from his staff. And they have been for years producing unbelievable results uh, because he understands that the more emotionally uh, incited you have someone the more they retain the complete opposite of what the current education or academic system is is perpetuating or pushing but so 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 when we sit up and we look at this we're not looking at why they're dropping out first and foremost and i agree we don't need to drop out why because when we look at the dropout uh, rate it directly corresponds with the incarceration rate uh when a, a, a child a, a black especially a male drops out of school prior to getting their high school diploma, they're five times more likely to become incarcerated. That's just simply the poverty element. That's not a race element. That is a poverty element and component directly associated, associated with and connected with um, uh, poverty. Uh, but more, they're going to be five times more likely to become incarcerated. Also, they're gonna be uh, policed at a higher rate than any other group. So they're gonna, gonna be at risk. So we get that. So all, 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 here we are and we say, okay, yeah, we, need to, we, we don't need to do this. But what we're not talking about, at the same time he's gaslighting on not dropping out, is the fact that even if the black male was to graduate from school, go to college and get a bachelor's degree, the high, the white white kid with a high school diploma would still out earn them on average. 
That's statistically the reality, but that's not discussed because that's not part of the gaslighting of black people. And he went on with some other things that, and he talked about uh, littering as if it's an exclusive black thing. Stop littering, start tearing up. You know, I've lived in predominantly white neighborhoods and we just don't do that. Well, that's again, a socioeconomic thing. And anybody who understands and actually studies and does the research understands that. Now, this isn't just about Don Lemon for me. This is just something that I just happen to see. And it's sort of tricky. I'm like, and people are literally going hard, like, and defending him saying that. And you never see any other group sit up and say, yeah, we're screwing that up. Yeah, we really got that screwed up. And the thing is, they've trained us to police ourselves and accept things without explanation. And I've told you over and over again, one of the things that we're gonna to have to become better at is asking questions. It's not just whether or not I can see a reality or I can prove that a reality exists. It is also me asking the question why. Because in the asking the question why, now I must examine the cause. When I examine the cause, causality tells me what must be done to change it. Sitting, sitting up simply talking about what happens leaves a lot open for speculation and you are allowing people to draw conclusions without any type of proof or justification or substantiation and that can't be done in any other area any other facet of life and be accepted as um, proven proven truth or justified truth but we allow it we allow them to consistently push on us because we don't want to do the research. We don't want to get behind the people willing to do the research. We don't want to stand with the people doing the research. We think that if a white voice says it, it has more clout and more validity than if a black voice says it, no matter how informed that black voice may be. That leads to our demise because we are constantly being led to the slaughter. We are constantly being pushed off the cliff. We are constantly being led into ditches because we don't understand how things work, because we don't understand uh, what we should be doing. Uh, we don't understand how we are being played. We don't understand that this thing we keep standing behind hasn't worked. We keep pushing black liberal, I mean white liberal ideologists, ideolo ideologies, and we keep pushing it in, in the sense of political party affiliation, uh, i.e. Democrats. But when you actually study the plight and the movement socioeconomically, politically, academically, and in so many other ways, the black, the, the, the black struggle, the black plight, the black journey, you'll find that a great deal of our suffering has come underneath uh, democratic administrations. The crime bill that decimated the black community um, was not only under a democratic administration, it was introduced and championed by the current president of the United States. And while Clinton has come out and said that it's one of the worst things that's a part of his presidential legacy, um, Biden still standing and holding his ground would not back down off of it. Um, and a, a lot of that is just, just being old and in 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 just you know recalcitrant whatever you want to call it he's just you know you know how old people get so again that's all of that but at the same time he wasn't that old you gotta understand that this man this this is in the 90s in the 70s this is the same man that fought busing of black children into white schools for equal opportunity and access to better educations he said that, that he would he, that would create jungles for his children he didn't want his children operating in jungles this is the same man that and, and, and the idea has been pushed for decades that if you're Republican, you're racist. If you're Democrat, you're for blacks. And the truth of the matter is racism exists on both sides. You're talking about a left wing and a right wing. They belong to the same damn bird. That damn bird has been shitting on the heads of black people from day one. And they just play the game. And now we're watching where there's a merging and coming together. And this is what you see with the whole Tucker Carlson and Don Lemon thing is the thing is coming together where you're going to eventually get to see where you can't tell which party is which. 
Uh, there are so many different things that I can get into as far as basic values, interests, and principles, and how at, on, the, on the level of our values, our interests, and our principles, white liberal thinking and ideologies don't even line up, especially for black Christians. But yet, those are the ones who push this the longest. Why? Because it's what we've always done. It's what mama did, it's what daddy did, it's what they tell. And every time that anything pops off, the first thing out of a damn's mouth is racist. And all that takes to trigger a black person is to call another white person, especially if it's a Republican racist. Nobody's looking for what is being done on either side. I don't champion either side, but I'm talking about how we tend to lean toward a side that has proven to us that they smile in our face, rub us raw on the backside every damn time. You got to ask yourself, if Dems are so good, and we've had a pretty good run of Dems, we had eight years of, damn, Clinton. Then we had eight years of Bush. Then we had eight years of Obama. And over that time, the racial gap widened, regardless to who was in office. You have to start asking yourself, what are we gaining? The black family was decimated. 90% of blacks who turn out at the poll vote straight Democratic ticket. And we've turned out in increasing numbers from the time that the Voting Rights Act uh, Civil Rights Bill was passed up until uh, Trump. Increased turnout every freaking time, every presidential cycle, 90 plus percent voting Democrat. And we have absolutely nothing to show for it because we don't understand how things work. We put so much value in the vote that we built nothing to hold anyone accountable. We built nothing to measure what was being done for us. We have no systems in place, no agendas in place, no protocols in place. None of the things that we should be having in order to measure where we're going, how we're getting there, and who is facilitating. Do we need to have allies outside of the race? Absolutely. We're not big enough to operate without them. But, not in the U.S., but we can't do it alone party lines because everybody within the party ain't for it. We've got to build allies that we can hold accountable. And in order to hold them accountable, there has to be something that we're expecting that we can say you did or you did not give it. And if you did not give it, there has to be an exact and specific and immediate response that they feel. And if we can't do that, then we're never going to be able to get anything done sitting around being caught up in our emotion and gaslighted all the time should get old. I just watch. I sit up and I say, okay, they just did this. Watch what happens. And here we go. We on fire about something that had jack shit to do with us. Or they gas us up about something that happens to a black person that shouldn't have happened. We get gassed up, fired up about it for a couple of weeks, maybe a month. And then you, man, what the hell happened to Sandra Bland? What happened? Uh, just shoot, you ain't gotta go back. Ralph Yarrow, how many of y'all still yapping about Ralph Yarrow? I'm checking on him every day. Let, I'm just saying, we are in that cycle. But, and here's why it's a problem. You, you didn't set out to forget about Sandra Bland. You didn't set out to forget about uh, the other young ladies that were killed uh, by police. Uh, so many names that haven't gotten justice. We only got a few that have gotten justice. Um, we, you didn't set out to forget about it. Here's the problem. You were moved by your anger. Anger is an emotion and it is a very short-lived emotion. It doesn't have endurance. You can't stay angry forever. And they know this. So they treat us like little three-year-olds. They know that we're going to get angry, but they know that eventually that anger wears off when we go back to being who we always are trying to fit in, trying to be accepted, trying to do what they say we should be doing, trying to live up to their standards and definition of what is, what's what's beautiful, what's classy, what's professional, all of these things. And we are policing each other to the tilt, trying to make one another act like they say we're supposed to act. 
instead of embracing ourselves and loving ourselves and standing up and being what we're capable of being instead of starting to hold them accountable for how they treat us instead of holding ourselves accountable for how we treat one another instead of building something that we can stand on on ourselves we're sitting around taking the crap taking the crap uh taking the crumbs and accepting every little freaking thing they throw at us good or bad time is up for that time is up for that I'm going to get ready to get out of here, get in, go chill with the fellas for a little bit. You guys have a good day. I'm out. Peace. Hello, everybody. Dr. Rick Wallace dropping in on you. Uh, I don't normally do live streams on Facebook uh, during the evening time. Normally, my live streams on Facebook take place <clears throat> in the morning time, and they're more focused on the work I do uh, through life change, life enhancement, uh, performance, uh, personal growth, personal development, blah, 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 blah. Uh, normally addressing issues in the black community as far as a live stream is concerned is done on my channel uh, for the Odyssey Project where I talk about all of the uh, things that are associated with the enigmatic issues that plague the black community um, but this time I decided to do the live stream on Facebook and then I'll transfer it to uh, the YouTube channel and, and other uh, platforms as I see fit. I'm doing it here because this is where I'm seeing a lot of the responses uh, to the final result of the Botham uh, Jean murder trial where Amber Geiger was tried for killing, convicted of murdering, and sentenced to 10 years. I've already done a video about the sentencing. I've already done a video about the complaining, the whining, the, 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 the helplessness uh, that we exhibit every time this happens uh, without ever coming together and putting together protocols, putting together an agenda, putting it together a strategic plan that can be worked step by step to uh, establish a position of power that we can respond to situations like this to where we can apply pleasure, uh, uh, pressure to this. Uh, what I want to talk about now is this almost instinctive proclivity of Blacks to forgive white people specifically, because let's be clear, we don't forgive one another the way we forgive white people. Let we, let's we let make a clear observational assessment of this behavior. This behavior is almost always pointed at white people when they wrong us. And it is done out, uh, outside of the natural, uh, progressive, and processive step-by-step uh, -step processes that's a part of authentic and genuine forgiveness. Let me explain something to you. I believe that forgiveness is a process in which you release something in order for you to be better. Um, it, it's a process, it's, it's a part of healing. It is something in which you go through, you grieve, you heal, and then you release. The forgiveness is a release, it's not for the person being forgiven, it's for you to stop bearing the burden of bitterness, anger, and hatred. Now, the truth of the, the, truth of the matter is, there are so many different angles associated with this thing that we do, we call forgiveness. Let me explain something to you. Walter Scott's mother, before he was in the ground, was forgiving the cop that shot him in the back five times. Let me explain to you, that's not authentic forgiveness. I don't care how you, I've, I've seen people you know, talk about it as if it's some type of barometer of how connected to God you are, how saved you are, how 
churched you are. The truth is it's something that's been instinctively instilled specifically in us. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. Get any evangelical white person that's gone under a loss. Forget them having lost somebody. Uh, Timothy Banks made a very, very uh, real point. Get all the white people that consider themselves evangelicals that are pushing every time something happens where a white person harms a black person, pushing and expecting and waiting on forgiveness. Post a picture with no caption. Post a picture of no caption on your page of Michael Vick. And watch, just watch how much they forgive. Go to any one of their pages where they've been harmed by somebody, black or not, and see where they forgive. Go on any page where they're talking about a cop that's been harmed by a black person. Months after, years after, and talk about forgiveness and get the response. I know it because I literally follow it. I've been studying this for years. I've been watching us forgive them while they offer no forgiveness to us. And I've been watching it be uh, assessed as some form of spiritual fortitude. No, it's a psychosis. Let's be real about it. It's a psychosis. Forgiveness comes as a part of a process. Just because you say I forgive you doesn't mean so. It means that in art, and, and let me explain to you where it comes from. Let me explain to you where it comes from. Number one is, you better understand that when white slave masters gave black slaves uh, the Bible, it was not to save their souls because at that time they didn't believe black people had souls. It was solely for the purpose of applying spiritual pressure to people who were highly spiritual to behave. The focus was always on the slave master relationship and it was about the obedience of the slave and adhering to the master. This is historically researchable, it's provable, but that's not the only thing. Let me explain to you, for 246 years, white masters sold away men from their families, sold away babies from their mothers, beat both men and women and children to a point of death, some dying. They sit up and uh, work them from sun up to sundown for 246 years, several generations of black people. And this is what happened. When, when a baby was sold from underneath a, a mother, you would find that within a matter of days, the mother was showing in some way that she held no bitterness, no anger, no, no, uh, animosity towards the master. Why? Because it was dangerous to hold grudges against the master. So you apologize. You let the master know you were good with the master. You let the master know that there was no problems because you had to sold off, uh, uh, that he had to sold off your children or sold off your man or sold off your woman. You, you made sure that they understood you weren't upset with them. That was passed out. I grew up with grandparents who had every right to sue the city, refused to resume behind that same mindset. The, the, let's be clear. This isn't a spiritual pro uh, process here. This is a psychosis that has been embedded in Black people for literally years, over a century. After slavery, it's been passed down generation to generation. You don't want the white people to be mad at you. So you have to show the white people that you've gotten over it. That comes out of slavery. That is not spiritual. That is not biblical. Even biblical forgiveness, as it has been highly manipulated and misrepresented and mispresented, is not what you think it is. There's no way that you are still this embedded in something that involves someone you so dearly loved 
and you're giving forgiveness to a person who has basically walked on it. You know how many people, let's be real, you know how many people will be dead right now if people knew I could kill a person and only get 10 years and not even be really expecting to serve the entire 10? You know how many people know that that couldn't be them? If that was them, they would be getting 25 and up. And I'm not saying that you kill somebody, you should get 10 years. That ain't what I'm saying. You know, I know for a fact how the system works. I've dealt with it personally. I've dealt with it with friends. I've got a family member serving 30 right now for killing somebody who was coming in his house to harm him. The other way around. So I know how this thing plays. And I've watched black person after black person sit up and offer forgiveness that's never turned around and aimed at them by the very Christian, white Christians they so adamantly love. And you don't ask yourself why. We don't like asking the question why. You know, we let, let's go back. We can go back about 50 years where uh, in not, a little more than 50 years, about 57 years, something like that, 57 years, uh, uh, 1963, I believe it was, Martin Luther King is in Washington, D.C. It's the March on Washington. He's giving his I Have a Dream speech. That's a part of this speech where he says something that sounds beautiful and, and it's awesome and it gives meaning to all the hell that we've been through in this country. And he was absolutely wrong. He says that unearned suffering is redemptive. No unearned suffering is the sight and sign of weakness. There is no value in suffering for nothing. Suffering is always a choice. Oh, a lot of people are not going to like that. See, if you're suffering because you've done something wrong and it's coming back on you, you, did, you had a choice not to do the thing wrong. And if you're suffering because somebody sees you an easy target and decides to grow up and come up off of you and you do nothing about it, it's still a choice. Yes, I'm hot, but I'm hot of sitting up and watching us be manipulated and sold a bill of goods and we jumping on it. You letting somebody study stomp on you does not make you more spiritual. It does not make you spiritual. Nobody asks, nobody probes. Everybody has allowed themselves to be force fed how they should interpret their relationship with God but, but they've been force fed it by someone who benefits from their oppression. They've been force fed it by someone who is going to literally benefit by mis misguiding, misleading, miseducating, uh, dominating, oppressing them. There are some simple principles of theology that should actually ask you, have you asking questions? There are, in theology, attributes of God, regardless of the relationship or religion. There are certain attributes that literally cross religions, certain, certain things that you can sit up and look, no matter what religion you claim, the attributes of God are the same. One of the most prominent and prevalent attributes of God that focuses on his integrity and gives you the assurance that what you can depend on from God is always going to be steady, is that God is immutable. What does that mean? God doesn't change. You're not having to worry about what you're getting with God. As God is now, God will be a billion years from now because God is God and there is something about his value system that he does not ever violate. That's what holy means. It simply means God has integrity. 
God has a standard and he operates by the standard every single time. And the way that he allows himself to love at the same time, hold people accountable is that the thing guarding the gate of how God deals with you isn't his love. It isn't uh, anything. It's his justice. In other words, what God's justice demands by his value, God executes. It has nothing to do with feelings. It has everything to do with principles. And why am I bringing this up? I'm bringing this up because when I study God in the Old Testament, what I see is a God that says, if you roll it with me, we roll it up on them. We taking what belongs to us. If you stand it with me, I got your back. We going hard. We, 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 we taking no prisoners. Go over there and kill them all. Then he promises. He promises uh, Joshua. Joshua chapter one. Look, look, dude, check this out. Moses is dead now. Don't worry about it. As I was with dude, I'm going to be with you. I am not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. As I was with Moses, I'm with you. I got you. I will defend you. I'm coming with it's go, It's me and you against the world, dude. Me and you. Joshua gets word that the Malachites are moving in on some people. They march all night to go to battle with the Malachites. Two things come out of this that are extremely powerful. The first thing is God, first and foremost, honors his word to Joshua. Not only did they prevail in their own battles, but God was also warring with them. He was killing the enemy. The Bible says, if, if you want to believe the Bible, the Bible says that he killed more with hailstones than they killed with the spear. God is saying, we go to war. We defend. We fight. We don't lay down. Then this is the same God that told him, go over there and kill everybody in the land. Don't leave babies. Don't leave nobody. This is the same God, the God that's immutable. This God is going to war for his people. Then another thing happened that, 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 that I look at. Because Joshua believed the promise, he did some exceptional and extraordinary things. They're warring, they're winning, but they're on the uh, opponent's turf. The sun starts to go down. Joshua is a general, so he's thinking, if the sun goes down and we can't see them, they're going to retreat. They're going to hide. They're going to go into hiding, and they're going to regroup. Joshua does something that very few people catch when they read the passage. He didn't pray to God. He didn't ask God for help. Joshua had understood what God had did before with Moses, and God, God had promised him, as I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. God, Joshua literally commanded the, the, uh, the elements of nature to change. He said, sun stand still, and the sun stop moving. And they finished the battle under the sunlight. That's the kind of power that operates spiritually when you are not walking in somebody else leading you into a ditch. If you literally think that God has something that he's teaching you in perpetual suffering, I'm talking 400 years now, 1619 and 2019 is 400 years. If you think you need that much, and then I hear us being compared to the Israelites in the Bible. Well, first of all, they were not in bondage for 400 years. That's a misunderstanding in the Bible. The 400 years in the Bible, there's two large numbers in the Bible associated with the Abrahamic covenant. The first is 400, the other is 430, and they're talking about the same period. The 400 is from the actual weaning of Isaac off of his mom, to the Exodus. The other is the 30 years from the point of God making the promise up until Sarah being pregnant, Sarah giving birth, and then the five years up to him weaning. That's the 25 years from the age of 75. The 25 years puts you at 100. That's 25. 
Then there's another five that it took Isaac to win. So you sometimes you get 430 talking about from the moment of the promise. And then uh, when, when, when Isaac literally what weans off and becomes the seed of the promise, it's 400 years. That's not when they were in bondage. They actually hadn't even went into Egypt at that point. Isaac hadn't even had the twins yet. Because you got to remember, it was the, uh, the son of the twins, Joseph, that ended up in Egypt years later. And so you're talking about roughly 100 and something years, 140 years, if I'm not mistaken. It's been a while since I broke that down. But 140 years that they were actually in bondage. So we, we need to understand, but see, that's just it. When you take a, a religion that somebody gave you and you don't put the time and energy and effort in, even though inside of the Bible it tells you study to show yourself approved, if you haven't took the time to really break that down, to ask questions, oh, they taught you not to ask questions, there were questions. But you gotta ask questions. You gotta ask, well, why was it like that? But it's not like that with us. You gotta ask. You gotta ask, why is it they had power and we don't? You got to ask yourself, what's the difference? That's a whole nother thing. Maybe one day I'll break all that down. But what, what, here's what I'm trying to get you to understand. Forgiveness is a process. It takes time. Forgiving somebody before you even bury your loved one that they took from you. Yeah, that comes. And see, the whole thing, forgiveness isn't what people want to make it out to be. We good, you know. When, if you harm me and you actually make it, meaning that I don't get you because that's going to be my first thing. You harm me or my family, I'm coming for you. I don't want no explanations. Your best bet is that those people get you and lock you up before I get to you. If you sit up and make it and they deal with you and you go off and you do whatever you got to do, when I forgive you, I'm not forgiving you to hug you. I'm not forgiving you to walk up and shake your hand and say, man, you know, I, it's all good. I'm saying I'm done worrying about it. I'm done stressing about it. I'm done holding on to that. It's time for me to move on and do something else with my life. I'm literally carrying a burden that's eating me up on the inside. I'm releasing it. Releasing it has nothing to do with being nice to the person who caused me the pain. All that stuff has been pushed on us. That's historic mental slavery, psychological slavery, where you feel obligated to make the person who hurt you feel better than you feel. That's not biblical. That's definitely not God-like. Talk about forgiveness. I tell you what, I'm going to end it on this note. I'm going to end it on this note. Talking about forgiveness. I'm going to end it on this note. Go to Psalms 109 and read that. That's David under assault, David under attack, David praying to God about how he wants God to deal with his enemies. And tell me where you find forgiveness anywhere in there. We better wake up, but we're going to forgive ourselves into instinction. Imagine, tell me when you got a people that's literally almost like they've been inbred to be evil. And they're coming at you. They're showing you every day with the way they treat you. That they have no regard for your being, your well-being and your interests. And then you tell them there is never going to be a consequence for the way you treat me. You actually think some kind of way you're gonna change what is evil by being kind. That's a bill of goods you've been sold. How has it worked for you for 400 years? At some point in time, you gotta stop praying. Uh, Frederick Douglass said it. You got to stop praying for them to get the foot off your neck and forcefully remove it. Some, at some point, you're going to have to stop begging them to treat you right and let them know if you come, they come against you, they better come with everything they have because you come in with everything you've got. 
black men. We're going to have to start sending a message that our black women are off limits. Our children are off limits. If you harm a black woman or a black child, be ready. We're coming for you. We got to stop this bull crap forgiveness. Now, one thing that I can say, one thing that I can say, and I can say it with cert certain, uh, a certain level of uh, certainty, if she, if she is actually, what the world? Is that many people checking in? Whoever is hitting, slow down a little bit. Let me finish before you do all those clicks and those lights. It's pounding off on my screen. I mean, that was like 60 in a row. Uh, let me catch up. Uh, but check this out. You have to really, truly pay attention to what's going on. You have to really, 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 truly pay attention to what's going on. There is absolutely, absolutely no one who's going to stand up for us but us. Nobody's going to stand up for us. Nobody's going to defend us. That's our job. Black men, we have a responsibility to stand our ground and defend what we have been given a responsibility to defend. That is an absolute must. I'm not asking you to carry bitterness the rest of your life. That's a heavy burden to carry and it's highly toxic. I, 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 I teach forgiveness, but I teach forgiveness in a place of reality. All of the stuff that was shown of how this woman, woman really feels about us. She's not crying because she's She's bothered about what she did. Look at what happened in the aftermath. This man died begging her to help him. We're not going to talk about that. I posted the video of the witness that they during, they during the destroyed a witness who came forth, who had the video of the immediate aftermath. She heard the shots and came out of her apartment and started filming. She's got this woman on the phone talking to her lover, not 911. Then she finally calls 911. He's laying there. She's never tried to save him. She didn't, didn't give anything. He's still alive. He's talking. He's breathing. And she never even attempted to save him. She's worried more about how it's going to affect her career than the fact she just shot a man in his house. And, then it, 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 and she didn't come to tears until she realized she was in a bind. There's a, there's a line, and it's not even a thin line. There's a line, a very bold line between forgiving somebody and holding them accountable. You know, I've seen it. But my thing is, the vast majority of these people that are so eager to forgive white people for doing some of the most atrocious things to us and I'm not and I'm not exaggerating have stopped talking to family members over five dollars I had that conversation not too long ago you you're not what she didn't give me my five dollars back five dollars you don't cut your family off for five dollars and you forgave this helper for shooting your brother Please know, even if I got a sibling that I'm not speaking to, if you touch them, I'm coming for you. That's my promise. That's why my family can depend on me. That's why my family, that's why my wife feels safe if I'm anywhere near. That's why my children can walk with their chest out and their chin up. Because if I'm breathing and I'm anywhere near, I'm coming. If you don't want to deal with me, it's real easy. Leave mine alone. I 
I looked up a couple of weeks ago, brother went hard in the paint about, about this nail shop that was mishandling black women. I mean, went hard in the paint, had it shut down for a day. Come back the next day, they got lines going into the place. Just begging to be mistreated. You are the person that dictates how someone treats you by what you're willing to accept and by the level and the magnitude and the force of the consequences that follow unwanted issues. Until you apply negative consequences to negative actions, it will not stop, period. You're not going to forgive them into liking you. Their very well-being and their position in this world is highly dependent on them mishandling you, oppressing you, killing you. And they have proven they have no problem going the full distance in doing it. You're not going to forgive them into that. And you're not going to, no matter what you've been told, you're not going to be given, given some kind of higher standing with God because you're so forgiving. Men, you're going to be held accountable for protecting your family. Sometimes that's going to mean putting yourself in harm's way. We live in a world where black women and black children can't feel safe. That's on us. Know your history. Know where your thinking and your behavior comes from. You will never be respected until you stand up and push back. Sure, if I'm not mistaken, it's even the Bible say that the violence, the violence taken by force, you are going to have to take something. It was, again, Frederick Douglass. Power concedes absolutely nothing. If you're going to get anything from power, you are going to have to give it through demand and through struggle. We've got to stop. We have got to stop. And this is this is so far beyond Amber Geiger that, that you can't even imagine where I'm at right now. I'm literally dealing with this every day, people coming to you. I mean, I'm not gonna call any names, I'm not throwing anybody, but, but you come through. You going hard in the paint, you got your people going down to the court every day. You got your people standing up and going and putting pressure on people in, in public office like DAs. You've got all this stuff going on. And then family go like, it's okay, we're good. Don't, don't worry about it, we're good. But you came to us. Don't worry about it. I, I don't have the stomach for it. Let's that basically what they're saying. I don't I don't have the stomach for it. I, you know, and, and, and forgiving somebody. You got all these people going hard in the paint for this young brother, only to see his family sit up and say, it's all, you know, we forgive you. We love you. No, no, no I don't love you. I don't love you. I, 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 I'm not into that. What I love, I fight and protect and defend. And I'm definitely not loving anybody that's moving against what I'm fighting, loving, and protecting. If you want to feel me, come against that which I love. I promise you. I promise you. With every ounce of my being, with every breath I have in my body, and that what I will take, I am going to come for you. And my problem is we have no problem going after the people if they black. We have no forgiveness for our own. It's, 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 I mean, it's obvious. Shit, we holding grudges from 20 years ago. But we've forgiven them and it ain't been a couple of years. And like we say, well, Walter Scott's mom, look, you know, and I understood when she did it, where it comes from. She was 80 something years old. She comes from an era where you don't stand up against white people and you don't want them to think you got a problem with them. So what do you, you say, no, it's all good. I forgive you. Why? Because I don't want you to think I'm coming for you. Because if you think I'm coming for you, you're going to come for me. I'm coming for you. Trust me. You want to meet me halfway? Let's dance. I'm coming for you if you mess with mine. 
I'm not afraid of time. You come from mine, I, trust me. Your best option is going to meet me halfway. If you're smart, you, you'll be running. I, 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 I don't have a problem dying for mine. But I'm not forgiving your ass. Trust that. We've, we've got to come and actually start thinking. We've got to sit up and look. God doesn't want you exposed like that. That's not God. That is not God. God does not want you exposed like that. You know, there are going to be some people that don't like what I say. Some people go going to friend me. I, did, I never set up the first channel. I've got numerous pages, numerous channels, numerous accounts that I do business on, that I work and, and share my community. Uh, uh, I share my community uh, work on and, and everything I do. And one thing that has been consistent is I'm not on for likes. I'm not on for shares. I'm not on to have my ego stroked. I know who I am. I don't need anybody to tell me who I am. I don't need anybody to tell me I'm this or I'm that. I don't need any of that. I was validated a long time ago when I discovered my gift and my purpose. I don't need anybody to tell me that. I'm not here for that. I'm not here to make friends. I'm here to share something that will empower somebody. Whether I'm doing it for the Visionetics Institute, whether I'm doing it for Master Fitness 21, whether I'm doing it for Mir Business Solution, uh, Odyssey Media Group, whether I'm doing it for the Odyssey Project. It doesn't matter. I'm about sharing something. And it's always going to be what I perceive to be the truth based on the information I have, I have researched, studied, and come to an understanding of. Am I right all the time? Absolutely not. I'm not right all the time. But here is what I can tell you. When I state the truth, it won't be based on uh, a, a pursuit of popularity. I'm not here to be liked. I'm writing a legacy that say I came, I saw, I conquered, I fought to the end. Sometimes that's gonna make people mad because a lot of people ain't ready for the fight. And I'm not talking physically all the time. A lot of people just ain't up to what it takes to stand up. I'll die on my feet before I ever live on my knees, period. I'm not folding against anything. My family depends on me being a man like that. We need to send a message that there are consequences. We, we need to send a message that there are consequences to moving against us, that there are consequences to mishandling us, that there are consequences to abusing and mistreating our children and killing our young boys. There has to be a message sent. The message can't be, we forgive on demand. And even sometimes when you release something, it is not required that you go tell the person that you're releasing, that they've been released. That's some old bull crap that's been bred into us. Your forgiveness is you releasing something and releasing someone from an obligation. That's what forgiveness is. It's a release of something. You're holding somebody obligated to something because of something they did. And you say, no, I'm not even holding them anymore. That's something you make up with yourself. That's you and God. It doesn't even have to be spoken to the other person. They put that in our heads so that they will know when we no longer are holding them responsible so they can feel safe. We better learn how to stand up. We better learn how to stand up. You know, I wasn't even meaning to get on uh, this long. I wasn't meaning to get on this long, but uh, one of the reasons why uh, Marion and I started uh, preparing to launch the um, House of Refuge Spiritual Center was because it was so many people of my people being misled and mistaught, being disempowered by the people who were entrusted with leading them to power, being mistaught. In, in, in their own faith practices, but about so many different things. And it's in times like these that I am 
unbelievably just flabbergasted and overwhelmed by just how off base we are when it comes to God. Like I said, I challenge everybody that watches this video to go to, to, to pull your Bible out and go to Psalms 109 and read what David is saying in his prayer to God about his enemy and to see how far off we are in the way we're responding to our enemies and the way David, who is said to have a heart after God, how David deals with it. Well, I mean, if you study the Bible, you know David took no prisoners. David had no problems removing people's heads. The only person I could think about of him sparing was Saul, and that's because he saw Saul, even after he lost the anointed, as being God's anointed. And he killed the person. Saul was trying to kill him, and he killed the person who said he killed Saul. But we over here forgiving people. Violet, take it by force. The violent take it by force. This, this is a very tiring vocation. Standing out front and defending people who will turn around and give up on you. Not on you, but on themselves, leaving you out there standing on your own like you making up something that they not even tripping on. We ain't tripping on it. You know, so, so you just called me and told me this, you, what, you just wanted me to hear it? Because now I'm standing up talking about it and I'm defending you, acting like you don't have a problem with it. And some of y'all dealt with that before. You go to speak on something because somebody said they upset, and then when they come back around, no, nah, I'm good. <laughs> um, it, 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 I mean, it's, it, it, it takes a lot. But anyway, look, I'm, I'm going to get off of here. Um, I'm going to get off of here and I am going to do the best I can uh, to calm myself down because baby just text me. So I don't want to go in there with this type of energy. So I got to go myself and me and God got to do some things and it won't take me long. I'll get my head right. But sometimes we got to be able to go there. Uh, we got to know when to use our aggression and when to be on 10 for the sake of the safety and the sanctity of our people. On that note, I'm about to get out of here. You guys have a great day. And don't forget, if you love what we're doing, um, especially those people who are gonna watch this on YouTube, you know the work we're doing because we share it all the time. Support us, uh, support the Odyssey Project. Uh, for those here, I didn't put any of that in there, but I'll put it in the uh, box uh, after I get finished. Um, but Support the Odyssey Project and the work we're doing, uh, Marion and I, on a, on a massive scale. Uh, on that note, I'm going to get off of here, and I'm done. You guys have an unbelievable evening. Think about what I said. Talk to you soon. Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Rick dropping here. Hope that everybody is doing okay. Uh, look, I'm not going to be long. I'm here to talk to you uh, straightforward. Look, the easiest thing to do is to complain, to complain about what others, what others are doing to us individually and collectively, to complain about what's not right, to complain about what should be going on. Uh, that's the easy thing. The hard thing to do is to take action, to do something, to change the things that we are not satisfied with. For my entire adult life, I have spent uh, energy, effort, and time and money into gaining an understanding of the things we go through, the things we face, the uh, mechanisms and machinations and, and, and all of the things that are working against us and what we can do to change that. And uh, uh, 
a, a couple of decades ago, I created the Odyssey Project as a research center, as a think tank to take what we find in our research and to use it to develop strategies and solutions. Uh, also, as a program development and implementation arm to take what we can learn and create these mechanisms and programs and initiatives to uh, deploy within the black community. We've done this for years. If you follow me, you know the work we do, we consistently do, and we'll continue to do. We need your support. It's that simple. Look in the description box. You're going to see a link to support or if you prefer to give via cash app, which some people do. There's the organization's uh, cash app account handle in there also. I mean, we got wraparound services that include mental health, uh, men and women, uh, special services and advocacy programs for women who have struggled with domestic violence or in, uh, in some instances, childhood sexual abuse or in uh, other instances adult rate uh, we have other wraparound services for men for training and job placement we are trying to make a difference but we do need support this is a massive and gargantuan effort uh, that's underway and it's so necessary. We're in last place in every statistical category from socioeconomics to politics to education to academics. Uh, we're in last place. And it's not because we are the worst, it's because we don't apply ourselves. We don't take action. It's time for us to take action. So I am challenging you to support the work we do. If you follow me, you know. So on that note, look, look in the description box and take action. On that note, I'm out of here. Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. Uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.